in an era in which humans were building pyramids and writing the first texts, time was moving at a slower pace on the quiet island of Cyprus. Or was it? Surrounded by the waters of the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, Cyprus has a rich history that dates back thousands of years. Some of its chapters, however, are less understood than others. One of these is the Calcolithic, and specifically the Late Calcolithic. But what is or when is the Calcolithic? The Calcolithic is a fundamental period of history that connects two important chapters of the history of humanity. The Neolithic, the time when agriculture started, and the Bronze Age. On Cyprus, the Calcolithic roughly spans from 4000 to 2500 BC. If you were wondering how we passed from stone to bronze, you would find your answer in the Late Calcolithic. You see, the narrative on the prehistory of Cyprus has always described the island as being isolated from the rest of the Mediterranean. This is a period where all around Cyprus you see weird things happening. You see pyramids being built in Egypt, you see big palaces in Syria, you see gold coming from uh, different places, lapis lazuli, amber beads, there's international trade systems. And then in Cyprus we still have people that are living in roundhouses, they have their own type of material culture and they don't seem to be partaking so much. That's the traditional narrative. Mm -hmm. However, this narrative on the prehistory of Cyprus is being challenged and changed thanks to the work of the archaeologists. The excavation of the site of Paludas, on the west of the island, is a testimony of what we know about the late Calcolithic. The people excavating there are helping us answer the many questions about this mysterious and fascinating period. It started with an email conversation I had with the late Professor Eddie Peltenberg. Initially, Aluras was really a rescue excavation. They were planning to build large villas on the site and destroy all the archaeology in the ground. So we were asked to excavate and to see if the site was valuable enough to be protected. Yeah, the site was already well known by the time we first came there. So what originally was a, a nice hill with a sloping surface had been uh, bulldozed into terraces and there were all kinds of roads cut through and some of it was already built up. But of course all this destruction also means that uh, you can see the archaeology quite well. I can just walk the fields and it's just covered with pottery everywhere. And uh, the densities of uh, pottery on the Catholic sites are like just stupendous. There's so much pottery. Yeah. I think Maria and her team have now processed some hundred thousand pottery shirts. Yeah. Uh, and that's just a fraction of what there is in that site. And after three years of extremely hard work, it was decided that indeed Palouras is special and important enough to be preserved as a national monument. We came in for two reasons mainly, apart from the, the rescue component. The late Calculatic was relatively less well documented. And we have a lot of it. And we have, uh, yeah, we have a lot of that. And also just a lot of new technologies and potential if you work nowadays that wasn't around in the 80s, for example. And so now we can do all kinds of new types of analysis. The possibilities for doing research have, uh, have transformed quite a bit. Every so often, um... I, we meet people in the village and older people, if I explain what, who we are and where we excavate, they would say, oh yeah, we knew that there was something there. And sometimes they will come with a box with stuff that they collected at some point. At some point, yeah. yeah. I always tell them, like, okay, you have to bring this to the museum. To fill the need of heritage management on Cyprus is not an easy task. Here's how fieldwork is conducted. A normal excavation day starts around 5, 5.30, we get up and we immediately go to the excavation. At the start of the season, the first, let's say, two weeks, you are usually doing a lot of manual labor. That means properly hacking at the soil with pickaxes and shovels and digging the first topsoil, which is about 30 centimeters deep or so. And there's not a lot of archaeology in there and it's usually very destroyed by the plow. It goes on for about six, seven hours in the field. We are really working and we're very meticulously taking off this first layer. It's brutal. Brutal. <laughs> brutal. Uh, I always tell people when they apply, like, okay, are you really sure? Because the weather is horrible. It is very warm. Uh, we get it up warm. super early in the morning. Uh, we, yeah. And then we go to site and we do 
backbreaking work uh, quite a bit of the time. Last year we started a new trench and so the picking and shoveling and wheelbarrowing, uh, that was very rough, that was very rough. Later in the season, as we are starting to get into the real archaeology, we are very meticulous and we go much slower. So when we're starting to find walls or floors or artifact clusters that are uh, in situ, we take it very easy and we use different tools. We have small little pickaxes, we have trowels and brushes to make sure that we can expose these contexts as well as possible without destroying anything. I think our excavation is on the cutting edge of uh, archaeological technologies. <laughs> we use everything from brushes to brooms to vacuums to, back, to yeah. everything to our own bare hands to dig up like hundreds of rocks. Yeah, fun for us to excavate. I'm thinking of uh, students that had to take out a lot of stones and number a lot of shirts. It's very tedious work, but they enjoy it in the end and they get very attached to it. It's their yeah. house. They live in it. Do you guys like remember the first time we used the the vacuum. <laughs> dust, dust cloud. Yeah, it is. Every day, uh, around one o'clock, we stop uh, excavating because it gets too hot in the field. And we go back to the house for a large lunch with the whole team. After siesta, we have a couple of hours extra to work on fine processing, such as washing of shirts, but also analyzing, drawing, and measuring all the artifacts. The result of this back-breaking work is the unearthing of several hundreds of thousands of artifacts revealing more about the Calcolithic history of Cyprus. Yeah. It is quite substantial. For us it's great because we have all these complete inventories inside yeah. and that's super fun to excavate. Uh, and that, uh, yeah, every time we, we hit one of these buildings we're like over the moon because, uh, yeah. Every single artifact is collected and documented by archaeologists. However, some artifacts are more intriguing than others. One of the really cool things about the Calcolithic is that they burned down one in seven buildings. It was actually very difficult to burn down a mud brick building. They were mostly built made out of stone and mud, uh, and this doesn't really catch fire easily. So it is very likely they had to add fuel to this building to be able to burn it down. And this tells us there were deliberate fires and not accidents. Another interesting pattern we see is that every building burned down in the same way and they have similar artifacts inside. We think that these buildings were burned down when they were reused as a storage facility. But then still, we are left with the question why they did this. Well, it's possible that someone wanted to destroy someone's property and all the sort of pottery wealth inside. Or maybe this was some kind of ceremonial fire. In any case, it's all a bit problematized and made it a little bit more difficult because something that we found in these buildings, a poop. In one of these burnt uh, buildings, we are excavating very carefully and then we suddenly notice something familiar. And it was a long little coprolite, as we call it, preserved poo. And we carefully excavated it. Since the first one, we found five more. It's actually a pattern as well. But for us, it, this, this type of thing is a gold mine because it can tell us a lot about what people ate. Yeah, it can tell us about diet. It can tell us about parasites that people might have had. Very intimate uh, health and uh, diet of uh, people 5,000 years ago. Aside from the coprolites, numerous pottery shards, buildings and Cypriot figurines were found. And thanks to some artifacts like the copper axe, which was found to have come from Anatolia, we now have evidence that at the time, Cyprus was already participating in wider Mediterranean trade networks. My favorite find of Polaris was the, the jar that we found in 2016, um, which when we lifted it, there was this, was this entire collection of objects. Cherry on the pie was this, this copper axe, which is by far the oldest substantial copper artifact on the island. It hits you when you, when you find something like that. I wouldn't quite put it on the same level as getting a baby, but it, it's, it's, it's a miniature, miniature version of that. Uh, you can tell a, a favorite find in an excavation most often because they, they have names. 
So like our figurative pestle is called Betty, and yeah. the pot has a name. The pot? What was his name actually? Panagiotis. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Panagiotis, <laughs> our favorite Cypriot team member. Yes, yes. <laughs> Also a favorite find was uh, in 2017 when I was still a student and in the field we found this uh, small picker light figurine which we called the alien because it doesn't look like a, a calcolithic figurine per se but it has like it has this very round it's a round head with a neck and it has like a little hairline and great and eyes and Bleda thought that it was a prank and that we made it uh, but it wasn't we found it and it's our little alien during the excavation, people are always welcome to uh, visit the site and we try to give tours as much as possible of the day-to-day -day, uh, life at the excavation. Uh, and always at the end of the season, we hold a presentation and uh, a small exhibit in the local community so that uh, people who actually live in the small town of Glorica have an idea of what we found and why we are doing what we are doing. Uh, there were a lot of people coming over with questions. There was mm -hmm. the amazing uh, Mr. Andreas, Andreas yes, who yes, yes. was a local benefactor of the excavation. He brought us like fruit and water all the time. Awesome. And we also had the interaction in the open day. We went there on the first day. It was a two day long uh, open day where we introduced the project to the people living in Hloraka, the village right next to our site. Especially over the past few years, we've developed a really good relationship with the community. They help us a lot and we try to do our best to help back and it's, uh, it's really nice. It takes a while before they trust you and appreciate yeah. you, but I have a, a magic person on my team which is sitting, who's sitting next to me, Maria, who is really cold in this regard. <laughs> and uh, yeah, she, uh, she speaks to the locals in the local slang and knows exactly how to talk to them. And yeah, yeah, I am a local, so <laughs> that helps. Um. But the main purpose of archaeology of sort of remote periods like this is to um, inform us about societies that were quite different from our own. There is this kind of uh, idea today that the neoliberal capitalist way of being is uh, something that has, has always always existed and that societies have always been unequal and archaeology is a great way of actually showing that uh, the different types of social models exist different types of relations with the environment are possible um, that not all societies are always unequal and, uh, and the Carpolitic of Cyprus is a good uh, example of that I think you can make this uh, argument that these people weren't simply cut up from the surrounding world, but they were actually making a choice not to go on this trajectory towards social complexity, social inequality, uh, and to do things their own way. Um, at least, that's what I like to think. As a Cypriot archaeologist, I was always very interested in what archaeology can tell us about our ways of being and about our identities and about how we choose to interact with the world and the outside world and to me I always find value in explaining what I do and also kind of trying to draw some parallels by how much I believe that the hybridity let's say of being Cypriot is not a bad thing as it might be portrayed in mainstream media but actually a really good and unique thing and not a new thing and for me that's very important. Personally, I've realized recently that when I'm in fieldwork, I am my happiest, truest self. I am focused there, I'm, where, I'm exactly where I need to be. I wait all year round to get back there and I am perfectly happy in my little bubble of uh, fieldwork and students and pottery and I, I go a bit crazy by the end and I dream of my shirts at night and those kinds of things but it's uh, in a way what we live for if you want to put it more dramatically. Archaeology in general and Palula specifically give you a unique opportunity to get intimately close to people 5,000 years ago. It's amazing. I always talk about archaeology as a kind of uh, infection that you will get at some point. <laughs> uh, you get this kind of uh, 
archaeology virus and it's not just also it's not just personal fun of course that's a great part of it but it's also you are the person that is responsible in some way of caring for some things that have been buried for thousands of years and that if you, if you don't step in will be destroyed and those stories will never be told. Victor once our brilliant field director and brain of everything digital and correlated uh, once so sent an email to uh, the Association of Secret Archaeologists to get registered the first time he moved and a friend of mine was undoing that and he introduced himself blah 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 and then said and I work at Paluras and we hope that we will be excavating this site until we die <laughs> that is the long-term goal to excavate as much as possible and to continue working and developing this community um, and having more and more people involved and yeah continue as we are and keep on growing.